Something was here before. Thank you. Never knew anybody wanted to hear me that bad. Now, uh, here, here's the problem that you run into, ladies and gentlemen. Whenever you decide to ditch those kind of things that are in the Bible just because you don't understand them or because you've never heard them before, uh, you get into the thing called the Mandela Effect. The Mandela Effect is simply, I've always heard it this way, so I can't believe what it says. I used the illustration for you the other day of the lamb and the lion laying down in the millennium. And everybody in here says, it's the lamb and the lion. It's not, it's the wolf and the lamb. But you've got so many statues and things like that and little deals of the lamb and the lion and the millennium and that kind of deal. They're pretty little statues and that kind of thing that you think it's got to be that. So when you read it in the Bible, you think, well, it must be a misprint. Now, one individual got on the, the YouTube thing and started making a big deal. And nowadays, anybody can get on there and become their own authority. And he got on there and said, well, the reason that happened was is when they opened up CERN, which is over in Switzerland, that they actually went back into time when the Bible was written and they actually changed it from lamb and lion to wolf and lamb. So they went in and changed that in your Bible. You know, for, for what reason? <laughs> Doesn't even make any sense. But that's like the flat earth foolishness and all the other kind of stuff that people want to deal with. What I'm saying to you is, is that just because maybe you may not have heard this stuff before doesn't mean it's not real. A lot of people don't want to believe there's a hell. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist just because you don't believe it. You'll find out sooner or later it's real. You need to get saved to avoid it. You say, well, you know, I just don't believe it exists. Okay, take your chances. But not for me. Somebody said, well, I don't think it's going to be all the, all the things that you say it's going to be and all these divisions and all these separations and partitions and people in all manner of, uh, of de-evolution and stuff like that. Okay, fine, no problem if that's what you want to believe. But it doesn't change the fact. And the fact is, is that hell's real. Even Jesus preached on it. You can try to air condition it all you want to, but it's not going to change the fact that it's there. All right, now it doesn't change these two kingdoms that are there, and that's why they're preached about by Jesus Christ Himself and those that herald His coming. You don't find kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God in the Old Testament as per se written out. You find it when Jesus Christ shows up there, John the Baptist say, uh, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world, and He comes preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in a couple of parallel passages there, He preaches the kingdom of God is at hand. Why? The king of both kingdoms is there. The kingdom of the literal, physical, earthly kingdom is there, and the king of the spiritual kingdom is there. Both king, the king of both of those kingdoms is present, and that's why he's there. He's there to offer them in Matthew chapter number 10. Go not to the way of the Gentile, nor into the Samaritan, half-breeds, half-Jew, half-Gentile, but only the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, you had a good sermon here on Wednesday night that told you about the Samaritan woman over there that came to the Lord and showing you a type picture of the church. It's a type. They didn't see that, but it's a type picture. You say, why? There's neither Jew nor Gentile in the body of Christ. All through the Old Testament, you see types. For instance, Eve is a type of the church. Uh, she, got, she came out of Adam's rib, the same place there's a hole in the side for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ willingly died for her, for your bride of Christ. Adam willingly died for her. You have all through the Bible, you have uh, um, uh, Joseph, who's a type of Christ, and about 152 to 155 particulars. He marries um, uh, Aphthanap, which is the daughter of Pharaoh. You're going to get real nervous now, I'm just going to prepare you. She's a black woman. She's a type of the church. Solomon says, Behold my wife. Solomon's a type picture of Jesus Christ there. In another place, he's a type of the Antichrist. He marries a black woman. You say, Why? It represents a Gentile, it represents a mixture. You get, um, oh, let's see, how about uh, Isaac? Uh, Abraham goes over there and he tells uh, Eleazar to go get my uh, son a bride. He goes over there, you know what he gets? He gets a half-breed. She's part from Sarah and part from Abraham. And you know what she is? She's from another country. That's a type of the church. You say, why? Well, when you get in the New Testament and you look back through Pauline glasses, you see Jew, Gentile, bond-free, male, female. They're not existing in the body of Christ. They're all in the body of Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free, male nor free. You see why? You're all Christians. It runs all the way through there. Uh, Noah, 
Noah was married to a, a black woman. You say, well, you're justifying, you know, biracial marriage and all that kind of stuff and all that. Why you always want to get into the here and now instead of looking at the pictures? Why does that stuff make you so nervous? You know, if, if you want to be so purebred, then you shouldn't be buried to Jesus Christ. You say, why? Well, he's a Jew. What are you? You're a stinking dog or a pig. You're unholy. You're unclean. You're unrighteous. You're unpure. There's nothing good about you at all. That's the hardest thing to get people to understand, even in the land you live in now. There's none good. There's none righteous. There's none that seeketh after God. All we like sheep have gone astray. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. The Lord looked at a Gentile and said, that guy will never figure out how to do it by the law. So you know what we better do? We better give it to him by grace. Now you better get a hold of that type and that will get your cotton picking nose out of the air to make you think you're better than anybody else. You ain't better than anybody. You get in through Jesus Christ and that's it. Yeah, there's a lot of that supremacy stuff going around nowadays. Hitler has been long dead. On, on all sides of the equation, right. Japanese, Chinese, all the Shim, all the Ham, all the uh, Japa, everybody thinks they're better than somebody. Yep. Well, you come to Jesus Christ and realize I'm not better than anybody. Right. I like Charles Tenley. He's a great, great old guy. He wrote about half a dozen hymns, and he was an old slave boy. Watched his mother whip to death in front of him. And they beat him so bad, beat all the hair off the back of his head. And he'd go put his shirt on and stuff. And his shirt get hung up on all the whip marks and all that. He's a real, real uh, talented guy. His father was sold off, uh, never saw his father again. And he was sold somewhere. And uh, wasn't allowed to go to school, wasn't allowed to go uh, to learn anything. And he got called to preach. And after he got off through working all day, he'd go to uh, 15 miles. He'd walk 15 miles one way to go to church. Charles Tinley, you can look it up. And then he said he was called to preach and he went up north. I can't remember it. I can see it on the paper, but I can't get the name of the place. But he went up north to start a church there and nobody came. Nobody wanted to come. Nobody wanted anything to do with him. You know what his motto was? <laughs> I am nothing. Jesus Christ is everything. And he left that place over there and they continued to laugh and to mock and to make fun of him. And he went over to another place and started in a storefront. And he got a hundred people. Black guy, white people coming. And then he went up to 150 and then 200 and then 400 and then 500 and then 1,200. And for 20 years, that guy ran an average of 1,500 every service, five services every Sunday for 20 years. That's the guy that supposedly couldn't do anything. When he first went in the ministry, he couldn't even spell three-letter words. He's the one that wrote in your uh, hymnal that you have there, nothing between my Lord and my Savior. He's the one that wrote, we'll understand it better by and by. That guy's an amazing individual like that. And 90% of his congregation was white. I don't know why you struggle so much with that. It's got to be pride and arrogance on your part. I, I, you know what I actually think it is? I actually think it's weakness on your part. And then what you have to do is, is you have to always belittle somebody else to make you look better. That's all free of charge. That's not in the kingdom deal here. I think you're trying to sit on the throne. I think you think you had something to do with how you were born. Did you put in your order? You didn't have nothing to do with it. I know proper English is you didn't have anything to do with it, but you understand you had nothing to do with it. Nothing. Zero, zip, nada. You can't hold a man or a woman responsible for something they had no choice in. Or well, maybe you can. Maybe you think, maybe you're more Calvinist. You're, the reason I'm doing this is the looks on your faces. I could get back to this right now, but y'all are, some of you, you're like, you're squirming around like you got bees in your britches or something. You, you had, you, every one of you should have been in the military or something for a while and realized that when somebody falls down and somebody gets hurt or somebody gets shot or somebody gets cut or be out there on the street and watch them in car wrecks, you'd be surprised the blood's the same color. Isn't that odd? Isn't that odd? I've seen every kind of thing you can imagine out there, at least a good portion of it. <laughs> and you know the strange thing? We all die the same way. We all bleed the same blood. I think the truth of the matter is, is you're inferior and insecure, and that's why you got little man syndrome. You always got to find somebody to put down. That's Hitler. That's Hitler. 
That's what he did. I'll put down an entire race of people. You think it was all Jews? You don't read. It wasn't all Jews. You know where pink for queers came from? Hitler put them in pink and sent them to concentration camps and burned them just like he did Jews. He came up with the stars for the Jews and came up with pink for them. And if you were black or another race, it didn't matter if you were black, if your skin color was black, if you were, had any Jew in you at all, although he had a grandmother with it in there. But if you had any Jew in you at all, you were considered inferior. You were considered vermin. I'm better than you. Supremacy. That's kingdom. That's kingdom. Jesus Christ comes to die for his kingdom and you want to kill for yours. You better get past that stuff. Uh, you say why. You, you live whether you like it or not. You live in an integrated society. You need to see people's souls and quit worrying so much about their skin. You're going to be surprised when you get up there to heaven. You're going to see TK up in heaven and Robin and you, you see they'll be walking down the street there and you think, but you look different. Really, what's different about me? Well, your skin's different. Really? Why is that? We all look like Jesus Christ. Everybody is the same. Okay, you feel like, I feel like we should like, okay, go ahead and let the oxygen come down out of the ceiling and blow in the bag and take some deep breaths. You'll be all right. It's going to be okay. You're going to be real surprised. You say, why? Did you not hear what I said? Did you not hear what I said? There's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free, male nor female in the body of Christ. You want equality? Get saved. (laughs) You know what you're likened to? You know what you're likened to? You're likened to a cursed man. You know why all through that Bible you see a white boy or a Shemite married to a black person? You know why you see it? You're likened to Canaan. You say it's only for black people. You're smoking crack again. That's a type picture of Jesus Christ. That's a type picture of the church. A servant of servants shall he be. That's what the church is supposed to be. That's why it's all through there. It isn't just for one race of people. It's for the bride of Christ. It's what you're supposed to be to each other and to the world. You're supposed to be the foot washer. You're supposed to be the hay boy. You're supposed to be waiting on other people, esteeming others better than yourself. Have you read how many times Paul said, a servant of Jesus Christ, a servant of Jesus Christ, a servant of Jesus Christ. I am bought with a price. Therefore serve God in your body and soul and spirit which are His. You've been bought and paid for. You're no better than a slave. And the Lord bought you and then set you free. Yeah. you got to get a hold of that. You want to find out what the church is really supposed to do? You know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to serve others. Yeah. Right. You're not supposed to be ruling over others. Right. The rulership comes in a millennial kingdom. Mm-hmm. Right now your job is to serve. Good for you. Amen. Right. Amen. If you could get a hold of that, I'm telling you what, it will change your life. Amen. Instead of expecting to be served. Right. You learn that I'm just supposed to serve. You know what will change your life? You walk in a restaurant and you realize you're fixing to throw some money down on the table for a decent meal. And I mean, I'm talking about something other than worm burgers at McDonald's or whatever. If that's what you want to eat, that's your business. But, you know, now they're telling you that it's all fresh and hot now. That's because they got caught because there was plastic in their hamburgers. But at any rate, you have to read to know that, not watch stuff all the time with the blue glow. Uh... You, you go in there and you know what you do? You're getting ready to pay the big money and stuff like that. And you walk in, you think you're a VIP. And the Lord fixes it where they don't get to you right away. To let you know what you think of yourself. Do they not know I just got here? I had reservations. Okay, so did a hundred other people. Works on you, doesn't it? And they come by there and they... Say, you know, what do you want? (laughs) Who are you to talk to me like that? (laughs) Pardon me, madam. (laughs) You ever put yourself in a position of the people have to wait on you? Would you want to wait on you? (laughs) 
I thought you were a Christian. Right. You know what you are? You're like the apostles sitting there at the table in John 13 and everybody knows everybody else's feet need to be washed and they refuse to wash anybody's feet. So the Lord himself has to get up and do it. Mm -hmm. Esteeming others better than yourself. Amen. You're supposed to be a servant. See? See how you got that Bible twisted? How you get it turned? You think it only applies to a race of people don't apply to you. Well, in type, it applies to you. You can't give me Bible for not being a servant. Every one of those crowns involves you serving Jesus Christ and not yourself. How good are you at it? Okay, well, altar's open if you like to come. <laughs> Boy, does that make you nervous or what? All right, we better move on. Uh, you'll find in uh, Isaiah 53, you'll find the crucifixion. In Psalm 22, you'll find the, cru the crucifixion. You find all kind of things in the Old Testament that nobody in the Old Testament saw. When we get through with this, I'm going to go through seven mysteries, and I'll go through the seven resurrections, and I'll go through seven baptisms, and I'll go through the seven judgments. I'll run through all of those sevens. I'll run through all the seven sevens for you when we get done with this to show you all the seven mysteries that are revealed to the Apostle Paul that nobody in the Old Testament knew anything about. But one thing they're looking for in Matthew chapter number 3, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the, the sin of the world. And in Matthew chapter number 3, He comes preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is a literal, physical, works-involved kingdom that has to do with a kingdom that's presented to the Jews, the Jewish nation. Isaiah chapter number 40, I showed you this last week, has to do with a literal, physical, earthly kingdom setting up a military rule, a military base with the nation of Israel being in charge of everybody in the then known world. That's what was supposed to take place when Jesus Christ came back. Should have happened with Satan. He blew it. Adam comes along, he blew it. Hands off to Noah. He blew it. The difference is here, the kingdom of God goes back to heaven and now you have physical kingdoms that are here that are placed into the hands of mankind and mankind blows it all the way through. They ask for King Saul. They come down here. They get David. He's the prince. They come to Solomon and it comes down here to Jeconiah and he cuts off the J and then the next thing you know it's Kaniah and then about 606 B.C. the time of the Gentiles enters in and 400 years of science they've said no to God in the Old Testament and the kingdom's in the hands of Gentiles and the Gentiles blow it. The Gentiles have taken into custody. Daniel keeps telling you there in Daniel chapter number 2. He's talking about uh, Israel coming back and the kingdom coming back and so on and so forth. That's under captivity. Israel's not in control of anything. They're nearly wiped out. They're in bondage. They're bond slaves. And then Jesus Christ comes and when Jesus Christ comes at the end of that which is the thing that I showed you on the, on the back side. When Jesus Christ does wind up showing up here, He offers both kingdoms and He offers them to the Jew. The literal, physical, earthly kingdom is the kingdom that they're looking for. They don't know anything about the spiritual kingdom. They don't know anything about getting into the spiritual kingdom. The only way you can get into the spiritual kingdom is you have to get in by a new birth. John chapter number 3. Do you remember that? You must be born again. They don't know anything about that gospel. The only thing they know about is keep the law, do the law, do what I'm supposed to do according to the law. All they're familiar with is signs, wonders, and miracles. They're familiar with the military rule. They're familiar with how God uses battles in the Bible to chase the nation of Israel and how under the judges and then under the kings, how He continues to use those nations against them and they continue to get beat down then they get right with God and they come back up and then they get beat down and then they come back up and it continues to go that way until the Lord just says, okay, fine, I'm done. Hands that thing over to the kingdoms there, to the other kings and all. That winds up in the hands of Gentiles. When he shows up as a little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger there in Luke chapter 2, 30 years later he steps onto the scene and he comes preaching both kingdoms. But it is predominantly the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is not the one that is you get. That's the spiritual kingdom. When they reject uh, Jesus Christ, or God in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ on Calvary, He leaves that kingdom there for a period of time, and Peter offers it again to him in Luke, uh, Acts chapter number 2. 
And when he's trying to offer that thing to them, to give them the opportunity to get into those kingdoms, they reject Jesus Christ there. They reject it by baptism. And then the next thing you know, up comes Stephen in Acts chapter number 7. You do always, stiff-necked and uncircumcised, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. And lo and behold, guess what happens? There goes the kingdom. The kingdom of God is uh, here and the kingdom of heaven is non-existent. Nobody is going to take over the kingdom now, so now it's going to be a spiritual kingdom. And he calls out Gentiles. Acts chapter number 8. you got to get this, and I'm sorry to keep wearing you out with it, but you got to get this. The first man saved is a black man. I'm not making it a racial thing. That's you. You've heard too much. You say, why? You ought to be glad. That's what you're likened to. You ought to be grateful for that. And so the first man saved there is an Ethiopian eunuch. He's riding there in his chariot and Philip comes up and says, Do you understand what you read? And he said, How can I except the man explain it to me? He said, What passage are you reading there? He says, By his stripes you're healed and then transgressions are taken away, well, chastised and his peace is taken away, so on and so forth. He said, Well, who would that be? Is that somebody? He said, Oh, that's Jesus Christ. What do you mean that's Jesus Christ a thousand years before the time that takes place? Well, that's prophesied. Uh, flip your Bible over there, eunuch, and take a look at Psalms 22. I am a worm and no man, and my, I'll tell my bones they're hanging out on me here, and I'm circled about with the bulls of Bashan, and uh, my, my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and not a bone broken. And he said, well, is that the same guy? That's the same guy. No kidding. Yeah, did you hear about him when you were over there in the temple? Yeah, but I, I didn't realize. How come the people, the Jewish people wouldn't take him? He said, well, I'm a Jew. <laughs> and they tend to be more intellectual than they do smart. You'll get that in a second. I said it right. They tend to be more intellectual. They got a lot of intellect, but they don't have any common sense. They didn't recognize the Messiah when He showed up. Well, how'd you get it? I accepted He was my Messiah. I had John's baptism to reveal the Messiah. Later on, the Lord had to come along and give me the Holy Spirit after He left. Acts chapter number 2, I'm sitting there in the room. The Holy Spirit comes, sat on me like a cloven tongue of fire. And I spoke in the language of the people that were there listening there. And I gave them an opportunity to trust Jesus and they wouldn't accept Him as the Messiah. And so we went off the scene there, but we had a great revival shortly thereafter. I mean, boy, it was really something you wouldn't have believed it. 3,000 people got added to the church. Jewish converts. No death, burial, and resurrection. Preaching, repent and be baptized. That's all they knew to preach. It's not even around. Stay with me. Preaching, uh, repent and be baptized. Preaching the kingdom of heaven's at hand. And he said, we preached and preached and preached. He said, well, how come you ain't still over there at the, uh, or not still over there at the, the big revival meeting? He said, the Lord called me out for you. He said, there's a man over there riding down the road and he's inquisitive about the scripture. He wants somebody to tell him something. I tell you what, go ahead and leave the big revival, the big tent meeting, the big camp meeting, the big sheep show. Uh, go ahead and uh, I tell you what, he said, well, Lord, how am I going to get way over there? And the Lord said, I'll take care of your transportation fees. No problem at all. <laughs> I'll give you first class passage. When they call your name, you get to board first and you get off first. So go ahead, and the next thing he knows, he's standing there on the road like that, and he sees a chariot coming by, and Philip said, well, how in the world did that happen? The Lord said, that's what you get for following me. You get to ride first class. Philip said, can we do it again? He said, just tend to your business. <laughs> and so the Ethiopian union sees him standing out on the road, and Philip's standing there like this, and waves him down, and he explains everything to him. And then he says, in the passage, cut out of all your new Bibles, he said, well, uh, I hear you talking about water baptism and stuff like that. He said, uh, I'd like to know something. There's some water. Could I get baptized? And he said, if thou believest, thou mayest be baptized. You say, why? It just changed. You enter into the kingdom of God by belief, not by baptism. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, he said, I came not to baptize. He did baptize, but to preach the gospel, showing you that it's changed. Different kingdom. Kingdom of God, Romans 14, not meat and drink. Luke 17, cannot be seen. It's inside you. It's right here. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not just the Holy Spirit, Jesus in me. That's a mystery. Figure that one out. Jesus Christ, if you're here today and saved, Christ is in every one of you but He's seated up there. But you're here. This is a great mystery. <laughs> 
And so Philip is up there and he said, well, here's the water. They go down there and they go down into the water. He doesn't go down and get him a cup full and throw some sprinkling on him and things like that. It's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the Ethiopian eunuch comes up out of that water and he goes down, you know, you know why they call it baptism, right? Because when their head hits the back of the water, it says bap. And then when they come back up, the robe comes off of them and says tism. <laughs> So he baptizes him after his salvation. And the next thing you know, Philip's gone. He gets a free ride out of there. On to his next mission. Off that Ethiopian eunuch goes to spread the gospel to his people and to the places where he's supposed to go. Acts chapter number 9, here comes the Apostle Paul. I'm talking about kingdoms here. You've got to watch the change. What are we fixing to change? We've got to change who we're preaching to. We're not preaching to Jews anymore. We're going to preach to Gentiles. Apostle Paul gets knocked off of his animal there, his beast, his horse, his donkey, his elephant, whatever it is he's riding. He gets knocked off into the dirt there and he's blinded. When he comes up after being blinded, he has a little boy lead him by the hand, just like the boy that led Samson there and took him down there on a street called Straight. Straight Street. That's a sermon in and of itself. And he's down there and after three days, the Lord comes to a boy named Ananias. And he says, Ananias, how you doing? He said, good, Lord. It's good to talk to you. How you been? Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Things are going really good, man. I mean, we've really been having a great time here. We're having a great revival and so on and so forth. Are you done now? Well, yes, sir. You're just like most Christians. You, you talk more than you listen. You want to tell me everything, but you don't want to listen to anything. That's in the trilateral root words in the Hebrew text there. You've got to kind of read that a little bit. But at any rate... So it, they come along there, I'm joking. So they come along there and Ananias, he says, I want you to go over there to the Apostle Paul and what I want you to do is, is I want you to baptize him. And he says, excuse me, Lord, bad connection. Paul, Saul? Yeah, tell him his name's no longer Saul. I'm going to name him Paul. I'm going to give him a Gentile name. Why? He's going to be the Apostle to the Gentiles. Lord, he's a Jew, I know, but I'm done with them for now. For now. For now. I, divide, I decided I'm going to divide the kingdoms. What do you mean you're going to divide the kingdoms? I'm going to give the Jew the literal, physical, earthly kingdom, which they won't get all the way until the millennium because they missed it when I went down there and showed up after to, to give it to them. And I'm going to give that Gentile the opportunity to get into the kingdom of God, which is not meat and drink, and they're going to have the new Jerusalem, and the Jews are going to have the literal Jerusalem, and then you go back and all of a sudden you start seeing Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile. You start seeing half-breeds all through there, all through there, all through there. You have ten camels over there representing going to a Gentile nation when Isaac goes over there or, or uh, Eliezer goes over there to get Rebecca. You have a type picture of her leaving mother and father. They come to her and they say to her, uh, listen, you know, we'd like for you to come on over here and, and uh, maybe come see my boss man. He's a great guy. She's a virgin, by the way, a chaste virgin. Not virgins, virgin. And she comes over there and waters his camels and things like that. And then they say, well, listen, uh, I tell you what, we'll go ahead and take the dowry and all, but how about this? How about you let her stay with us 10 days, Gentile? Stay with us 10 days. And said, well, why don't you ask her? And she comes in there and said, would you like to stay here for 10 days with your family and then you can go? Or would you like to go with Eleazar over there to meet your new husband? Uh, his name is Isaac. Yes, he's been telling me all about him. The wonders and the things he's told me, the splendor of his kingdom, and I can't imagine it. I'd, I, I think I'd like to go over and see him. Well, you can stay 10 days with mommy and daddy and your brothers and sisters, and we'll have a proper farewell for you, or you can go. And she said, I will go. A man will get married to a woman. The Bible says she leaves mother and father and cleaves the one to the other. Amen. That's a picture in the Old Testament of a woman telling mom and daddy, I'm going to go and follow the man over to meet my husband. And she comes over there riding on those camels. There's a lot on those camels. I've got time to go into that. And she goes over across that burning sands and across that desert. And all of a sudden out there on the plain, out on the horizon, she looks up out there. I feel like preaching on that this morning. She looks out there and there's a guy walking around in the field. And Eleazar said, you see that guy out there? He said, that's my boss's son. 
He's the prince. Boy, he is something, man, you have never seen anything like that. He gets to talking about it so much, she can't wait. She, the camel's going too slow. She jumps down off that camel and takes off running and winds up at the feet of her soon-to-be husband. And they wind up getting married, and they go into Sarah's tent. And she's a half-breed. And he's a type of Christ. He's a type of the Lamb. And he marries somebody like you. Yes. God's bride in the Old Testament is the Jewish nation. You're not a Jew. You're a Gentile. You're the bride of Christ. There's two different brides there. If you don't get that, you get the wrong kingdoms. What happened? But Paul gets called out there. Now he's get changed three years on the backside of the desert for the Lord to explain the mysteries to him and to tell him all the things. And now you have a change in the kingdoms. On the backside over there, what happened after Calvary is, is the kingdom of heaven remains for a while and then it's disappeared and now the only thing available to you is the kingdom of God. Uh, that would mean that it stays around only during this time period. Now I showed you this on Wednesday night and if you weren't here, I guess get the tape for you. But this thing applies for this period here. Now this is what somebody said the other day. Now hold on just a minute, preacher. You know, uh, there's no Gentiles over here. Well, there's a few converts. Yeah, but it's not really the church because the Holy Spirit hadn't been given. Yeah, but Christ has to die in order to get a bride. And after Acts chapter number 2, which I wrote right up here, the Holy Spirit is given, but there's still a big revival goes on in Acts chapter number 1. There's 3,000 added to the church. Added to the what? To the church. You say, why? Because Jesus Christ has died. And they're added into it in a different way. They have Jewish converts right here. All the way up to Acts chapter 7. And in Acts chapter number 7, the Gentiles get in. And guess what? The Jew and the Gentile, after Paul comes back... Can I ask you this question? How could they have got in by the death, burial, and resurrection? Paul hadn't even preached it yet. Um, by the way, 9 is after 7 and 9 is after 2. Acts 9 is when Paul gets called out. And then he spends three years. You're transitional. The best way I can explain transitional to you, it's like a dimmer switch. It gradually gets brighter and brighter and brighter the more you turn it. The further you go, the better you're able to see you are. And then until it's finally all the way on. But it's transitional. That's why you want to always be careful in the books of Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews. For those of you that aren't Bible students. Matthew, Acts, Hebrews. Not at my house, but at any rate. Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews, they're transitional books. Going from Old Testament to New Testament. Going to Calvary. Going from the Jew to the Gentile. Transferring. Going from the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of God. Transitional. Into the book of Hebrews, we're fixing to go into the tribulation. You've got to be careful in the book of Hebrews, although there's some great preaching in Hebrews. You say, why? Because a lot of it is tribulation doctrine. You've got to be very careful in that book. You've got to be careful in the book of Acts. Why? There's about four different ways to get the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. So if you're not careful, you camp out in the wrong place. You preach the Church of Christ doctrine. Repent and be baptized every one in the name of Jesus Christ. You shall receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Repent and be baptized. They're preaching that this morning in many churches. Anybody that points you to anybody but Jesus Christ for salvation is pointing you in the wrong direction. If they point you to a church, if they point you to a person, if they point you to an outfit, they point you to 12 steps or anything else, if they point you to anything but Jesus Christ for salvation, they're pointing you in the wrong direction. You're living in the last days and the light begins to get dim. The Bible says you're not in the dark, you're in the light, so walk as children of the light. But in the darkness, you know what happens? People are running around with artificial light. They're trying to point you to the wrong thing. They got flashlights on and car lights on and fluorescent light bulbs on and that kind of a thing. False light, false light, false light, false light. You better make sure they show you the light. Amen. Not like old Jimmy Pickens or whatever his name. When I saw the light, Lord, I saw the light. You know, yeah, you saw something. People think that guy was saved. I don't know if he was saved or not, but he didn't get saved because he was laying down there drunk in the back seat of that car, headed up to his house, and he saw the light on the porch. And he made it a religious song. People think because he sang that or Elvis Presley sang Peace in the Valley, that must mean they're saved. 
Yeah. Mm-mm. You mean old velvet voice? Well, if he is, there he is. I don't know if he is or not. I couldn't tell you if he is or not. You sure couldn't tell by his testimony. Just because when he got in a drunken stupor and got high on pills and stuff after his concerts and went in there and played uh, hymns and stuff like that, that don't mean anything. If he did, he sure had no convictions about how he lived and how many people he led to hell. I admire Ed Sullivan, whether you think so or not. But Ed Sullivan, they have to, they, he had to, first he told him no, and then eventually he got to be so popular and all that, and the colonel kept putting pressure on him <clears throat> that he finally said, we'll have him in, but you've got to film him from the waist up. Because right. my show was a family show. You know, he'd have monkeys on there and he'd have people riding bicycles and trained dogs and, you know, he'd have singers and all that other kind of stuff. And eventually he started having the Beatles and the rock and roll groups and Rolling Stones and all that. Had Elvis Presley in. You know, they, he said, film him from here up. Nowadays they call that censored speech. At least he had some values. You say, why? People would have rioted back then. Nowadays, it's common. Nowadays, here I am in an independent, Bible-believing Baptist church, and I mention one of your gods, Elvis Presley, and you're like, well, now you don't know he wasn't saved. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Blow the dust off your records. Have at it. <laughs> and there shall be peace in the valley. That guy had a voice like silk, man. I don't, I, don't, I don't know, but the devil sure got in there somewhere, tabrets and pipes, because he sang a whole lot more of the other stuff. But you just ignore that, don't you? How many people you reckon went to hell listening to that? How much fornication do you think went on while he was playing in the background? Yeah, you never give that any thought, do you? It's a transitional period in these books right here. So what you'll find is, it's about 80% of all false doctrine comes out of one of these three books. It's a truth misplaced. If you don't put the truth in the right place, then you run off into a ditch and now you've got everything messed up. You say, you can't talk about other religions like that. No, you can't talk about other religions like that. I can. Because I have a Bible. So you think you're right and everybody else is wrong. Well, sure I do. Why do you think I'm standing up here? I'm not up, I'm not up here trying to... I mean, are, what do you expect? You think I'm going to get up here and tell you, listen, go to the church of your choice. You don't ever go to the church of your choice. You get down and pray and say, God, where do you want me to go? And if he sends you here, it's like, God, are you got Alzheimer's or something? What in the world have you done? Why would you send me there? Well, the guy may not be much on delivery, but at least he's got the truth. I do believe I'm right. I believe I'm 100% right because I pre preach what the Bible says. But nowadays, it's all this kind of, well, what makes everybody happy? I don't care what makes everybody happy. I care what makes him happy. Here's what the Lord did for me. The Lord dumbed it down for me. The Lord fixed it. He says, listen, quit worrying about everybody. People are fickle. You'll, you'll please them one minute. They'll be mad at you the next minute. You just do this. How about just make me happy and we'll be good? I said, you mean I can go just make one thing, one person happy? Yeah, just me. I said, okay, I can handle that trying to make a few hundred people happy. I can, man, good night. I can't ever make them people happy. The Lord said, don't even bother to try. I've been trying since Adam and Eve were around. I just had to let them make their own choice. I'm just here to please the Father. That's biblical doctrine. So I please the Lord and guess what? Eventually it's going to upset somebody else. All right, so we're in a transitional period. Now that means that your apostle during this time period is uh, the Apostle Paul. He was changed from Saul. you got to get something in his name here. Saul is a Jewish name. Right? Saul in the Old Testament. Saul's a Jewish name. It's still a very popular Jewish name. He changed it by changing one letter to Paul. Now there's a lot right there that people don't even see. You say it's just a letter. More than a letter. He changed him from Jew... To Gentile. In the Old Testament, you had a man named Abram. I'm fixing to shock some of you. <laughs> he was a Gentile. As was Adam and Eve, and as was Noah, and all them all the way up 
until this bird comes along, this fellow comes along. When this guy comes along, he goes over there and he offers his sacrifices and the Lord uh, says all the things that he does to him. He brings the sacrifices up there and all that and he makes a covenant and he said, I'll bless them and bless thee and curse them that curse you. And then he comes up there and when he offers his tithes to Melchizedek, he changes his name. Abraham, which by the way, Ham was forbidden for the Jew. <laughs> one preacher said, one preacher said, he said, you know, if you start giving like Abram did, he'll put some ham on you. <laughs> uh, ham's good if you can eat it. Have at it, man. Enjoy, enjoy all you want to. But that Jew's forgiven, forbidden, the Jew's forbidden, the Jew is forbidden to have anything to do with pigs. You say, why? Go not to the way of the Gentile. Why do you think when they had hogicide over there, a suicide over there with a demon-possessed man, they run off there and jump off in the ditch there, they knew better than to be handling pigs in the first place. Why do you think it's such a tragedy when that boy over there in the book of Luke there, Luke 15, he goes over there and he's feeding pigs. They're not to have anything to do with pigs. Well, with all due respect, ladies and gentlemen, you're likened unto a dog or a pig, the two of the filthiest animals in the book. And there's a reason he does it that way. This is going from Gentile to Jew. Kingdom. And now it's going from Jew back to Gentile. Well, lo and behold, you would know that the Lord might do something like this. There's a little thing over here called the rapture. Does this make any sense to you at all? Yes, sir. This should excite you. There's a little thing called the rapture. You say, what happens? Well, it's not going to happen. It's not going to take place. Somebody sent me an article the other day and said, evangelicals have given up hoping for Jesus Christ to come. They now realize the foolishness of believing in such uh, uh, something they put on there. They didn't interview me. I hadn't quit looking for him. You quit looking for him? I figure he might show up today. You know, everything gets real good. Bam! Just like that, you know. <laughs> And just like that, suddenly in the twinkling of an eye, you're gone. Just like that. Amen. Boom! Amen. You're gone. You're history. <laughs> Put them back up, boys. It was just a shout. It wasn't what you thought it was. <laughs> All right, this thing called the rapture takes place. This is the end of the Gentile time. This is the end of the church age. I apologize for my chart up here. The church age, the bride of Christ, is closed at the rapture. We'll get into Psalm 45 in a little while and I'll show you the friends of the bride and all that other kind of stuff. At that time period, guess what happens? You enter back into a thing called the tribulation. During the tribulation, you have 144,000 male, virgin, what? Well, isn't that interesting? We're going back to the Jew. I don't care what Pear Man says in Texas. Mr. Schmida, Blood Moon, all this other stuff has an opportunity when they move the embassy to Jerusalem on Monday to speak up for Jesus Christ and doesn't open his cotton picking mouth. And he's a, supposedly a preacher. You might not have caught that. They get up there and Chuck and Jive and Shim and Sham and all that kind of stuff and they trying to make it, well, see, the reason is because he doesn't believe the Jews need Jesus Christ. I know y'all listen to him because he's a nice guy and he's got great illustrative stuff and got all kind of charts and things and he writes all kind of books. None of them ever come true. But nobody calls him on it. So it goes back to the Jew. You say, what happens? During this time period, ladies and gentlemen, where the Apostle Paul starts his ministry until the church goes out, is the time period right here, and that is where this kingdom is in existence. Now, why is that important, preacher? What difference does that make? This kingdom is obtained by a new birth. There are no works. There are no signs. Amen. There is no healing as a sign to the Jew. I didn't say you don't get well. I had the flu once this year. I hadn't had it in years. I had the flu. I got well. I don't still have it. 
but I had to lay low and take some stuff to help me kick it. So there's still healing, but not the healing where the guy walks up and says, Arise from the dead, or the blinded eye can see, or the leper can, uh, can get his spots healed, or the lame can walk. There's, not, there's no signs at all. Why? All this is connected with the nation of Israel for this kingdom. Well, look at that. Come to Mark 16. What time is it? Are we doing all right? Look at Mark 16. This is going to be shocking to some of you. Oh my Lord, man, we're way past time. <laughs> all right, well, let's just go on, all right? Let all the people come in. This is the church. This is the steeple. Open the door. See all the people. <laughs> All right, now look in verse number 14. Mark chapter 16, verse number 14. If you need to run to the restroom, go ahead, I understand. If it's time for a nursery change, go ahead and do that. Afterward, he appeared unto what? The eleven. So who would that be? That would be all the apostles minus who? Judas. Good, Judas Iscariot. As they sat at meat, and he upbraided them for their unbelief. Why? You've got to have that belief as an activating thing that causes the signs to work. And hardness of heart, because they believed not them that had seen Him after He was risen. Now watch. And He said unto them, who is the them? The eleven. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Stop. What gospel would that be? Who's He talking to? The eleven, right? They're Jewish apostles. What gospel would they be preaching? What kingdom? The kingdom of heaven. Literal, physical, earthly kingdom. Paul has not been given the mystery of the kingdom of God yet. He's preaching the kingdom of heaven. That doesn't mean you shouldn't go and preach and all that stuff, but you can't use this as a proof text that says you've got to go preach. You say, why? Look what's connected to it in verse number 16. And he that believeth, uh-oh, and is baptized? Do you have to be baptized for salvation? Now notice how he words it. He believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Not he that believeth shall be saved and then he should be baptized. Why? You're still Jewish and now the receiving of the Holy Ghost is going to come by baptism. Repent and be baptized everyone in the name of Jesus Christ and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Alright, now notice. And, but he that believeth not shall be it's okay to say that in church if it's in the Bible. Okay, but not in the sense of cursing. All right. And verse number 17, these what? Uh-oh, shall follow them that believe. What are the ones that are believing? The ones that are Jewish apostles. In my name, the Jew will cast out devils. They'll speak in new tongues, take up serpents, drink any deadly thing, shall not hurt them, shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Well, lo and behold, I, now I got James 5. Now I got them being able to drink wormwood. Now I got uh, uh, Paul being able to be bit by the snake and, hung, and shake that thing off. I got all the things that are for us Jews to see. They're all right there. And I could go right off into the tribulation right there. And the 144,000 male virgin Jews have the signs of an apostle because their message is back to the Jew. Because that's the kingdom that's coming. Now watch. They take up the serpent, it doesn't hurt them, and so on and so forth. And, and then look, if you will, please, verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with what? Signs. Wherefore, tongues are for a? Signs. Not to them that believe, but to them that believe? Jews require a Sign. Greek seek after. Wisdom. Okay, so now you understand where it fits. Different kingdom. You get those two kingdoms interchanged. I'll go over more of this tonight. Uh, you get these two, those two kingdoms I showed you on the other side here uh, interchanged. you got all kind of people running around now. You've been by churches that say the uh, prophet of the apostolic sign church. <laughs> we have the apostolic signs. We have the signs of an apostle and this and that and the other. Not in this age you don't. The Apostle Paul doesn't do it. Let me ask you a question. You find for me a place where the Apostle Paul spoke in tongues? He didn't do it. You say, why? He's going to Gentiles. Paul said, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity. He didn't say he did. I become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. So signs doesn't, don't mean anything to you. You walk by faith and not by sight. 
Now you're given a greater thing for that. You get a great reward for walking by faith. All right, we'll take a short break.